looking at what the Bible says this evening about deacons, and there's no place more explicit in God's Word than here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about, uh, about the topic of deacons. Beginning our reading in verse 8, let's, uh, let's take a peek here at what God says here concerning a very important office within the local church. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for those who have served faithfully in this role, in this office of a deacon. We'll pray that you might uh, show us the importance of this role and that, Lord, uh, that it is a good office to aspire to. You've placed it in the forefront of, of church ministry and one is a, that is a vital, vital role to play. Thank you for this enlightenment tonight. Be with me as help me to make it clear. In Jesus' name, amen. It's interesting to me that when a pastor is described as desiring to serve in the ministry, he is said to have to, to desire a good work, chapter 3 and verse 1. But when describing the role of a deacon, it says that a deacon who serves well purchases a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's a distinction that the Bible is making between the two offices of a local church. And we'll get into that, what, what that means a little later. But it is as if those who come to serve in the position of deacon and take it seriously enter into a context of expansive ministry. Whereas it doesn't say that about pastors. It's as if the position of deacon could be a launch point for greater service. As I said, we'll, we'll talk about that aspect of it in a few minutes. Suffice to say that the, the office of a deacon is essential. It is a crucial office. It is comparable in qualifications to pastors. Hence, in verse 8, it begins with the word likewise. Like wise? Like, likewise what? Likewise the pastor. Uh, because verses 1 through 7 talks about the qualifications of a pastor. Therefore, in verse 8, when it says likewise or in like manner, it's talking about the office of a deacon. What is a deacon? Well, deacon is a servant. The word literally means one who serves. It is used sometimes in the context of slaves serving. The first deacons we see back in Acts chapter 6. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles to Acts 6, at least every, nearly every Bible scholar I have read says that in Acts chapter 6 we have the appointment of deacons within a local church. They're not called that, per se, explicitly, but... These were people who were serving within the local church that were chosen by the church to serve in a particular way. And so in Acts chapter 6 and verses 1 through 7, it says, In those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring. Murmuring is complaining, is grousing. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians, these were Greek-speaking, culturally Greek Jews. 
there arose a murmuring of the Greek-speaking, culturally uh, conditioned Jews against the Hebrews, meaning Hebraic people that spoke Hebrew, Jew, Jews as well, only different kind of cultural ethnicity. So there was this complaining of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. There was a problem within the early church. The problem was, was that there was discrimination being claimed, charged. Think of our food pantry. Uh, if the administrators of the food pantry treated some people differently in the church than other people. You know, some people got the good stuff <laughs> as opposed to, to the Acme brand. I, it, we don't have that. Ever, all of it's good. But say there was a quality difference between the food that we get and, and the problem it would be causing if the food pantry distributed food to some people differently than to other people within the congregation. This is what was essentially going on. The widows who had no one to care for them in the local church, there in the church in Jerusalem, um, were being cared for, and the charge, and we don't know if it's true, right? But the charge is serious enough, right? It can, and since the, that church in Jerusalem had probably upwards to thousands of people involved with that, potentially that could have caused a huge, huge church split, correct? I think so. So, they got word, the apostles got word. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And so they gave a directive, Wherefore, brethren, look you out among yourselves seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. They were requiring selection of distinctive men within their fellowship of believers, people that the, uh, that the fellowship at large, the believers, the Christians within that local church esteemed highly as spiritual, as men of good reputation, submitted, uh, who submitted personally to the Holy Spirit and who were wise individuals, well-respected people. And the local church was to select these individuals out and, uh, in whatever way, I mean, we don't know exactly the way they did it, whether they did it by ballot or how it was done. But obviously, when the apostles said this, somebody said, you know what? Stephen would make a great deacon. And other people said, yeah, that's right, he would. And someone else said, Philip would. Philip, how about Philip? Yeah, 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 Philip, he's a great guy, and he's really got a clear testimony for Christ. And, and certain names were submitted, and um, the apostles said, you take care of that. We will give ourselves continuity to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose, they, the multitude chose, Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. There were results, fruit, fruit that came from that. But these, it's almost universally, to, uh, universally agreed that these were the first deacons. What did they do? They served in an administrative capacity, but in conjunction with the physical needs of the congregation uh, at that time and other problems, other kinds of administrative kinds of needs. What do, what do deacons do? Well, deacons do what pastors don't do, what aren't commanded to do. They, they, uh, they will take care of the practical necessities of the, of the local church. And um, they uh, resolved a potential problem among the believers there. So it wasn't simply, you know, ordering the toilet paper. It, it, was, it was settling disputes and being uh, in a... Uh, in a resol resolution role within the congregation. Very vital, designated to take care of the practical needs within the congregation. And these were individuals that had to have a good reputation, submitted to the spirit and wise. 
The distinction between Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy 3 is how much detail we have concerning deacons. And in Acts, excuse me, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we have in the first section, 1 through 7, the qualifications for bishops. For, these are pastors, overseers, uh, shepherds, if you will. The words are exchanged, uh, uh, they are exchanged as synonymous terms, pastors, shepherds, bishop, that kind of thing. But in verse 8, we start seeing the necessary credentials for deacons. Now, some of these are very, very similar to what we covered when we were, in, were talking about pastors, and so I'm not going to go into the level of detail uh, that I did in that other uh, message. But if you were here for that message, you, you will freely see that, I mean, this, uh, see that the, that the qualifications are very, the credentials are very, very similar. Uh, the, they differ very little. The only substantive difference in their qualifications is the mandate to teach. Deacons are not mandated to do that. Uh, they are mandated to serve. And as we, let, we'll move very quickly through these in verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave? This is the word, means honorable or good character and reputation. They are people that are worthy of respect and uh, people that the people in the congregation know and that they know that they are, they are people of, uh, who are serious men of dignity. They are of good character. Then it says, not double-tongued. Now, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The, the word literally, would, it would be kind of a hyphenated word in our language, but it's the word dialogos. And... Uh, translated double-tongued. Now, it's not forked tongue. <laughs> you know, when we talk about forked tongue, you, you, you speak with forked tongue. Um, forked tongue, it would be lying. Double-tongued would be a kind of lying. And what, it, what that is, is telling, telling one thing to one person, but telling something concerning the same subject to somebody, it's, you tell them something different to someone else, but the same subject. Follow through, you know, you, you may have been putting the, this situation where somebody tells you a story and you say, where did you get that? And they tell you, well, I got it from such and such. Well, that's not what they told me. You ever have that, so, or something similar happen? Two different stories by the same person, and it changes depending on who it's being told to. That's kind of it's kind of like politics, isn't it? You know, a politician gets up in front of one group, tells them what they want to hear, and gets up in front of another group and tells them something different, tells them something they want to hear in order to secure favor. That is double tongue. Different stories uh, to different people. One who makes contrary or differing declarations on the same subject at different times. Not double tongued. Um, and the idea that is that when a person does that, they are, they are gaining some kind of personal advantage. It's not simply playing a joke, you know. It's, there's some personal advantage taking place there, perhaps some power play within the local church, so they tell people what they want to hear. And then the deacon is supposed to be clear, clear-headed, not influenced by alcohol not given to much wine. This is very similar to what it says concerning uh, the pastor uh, in, in verse 3, not given to wine. And, uh, and we already went through the, the idea or the facts, really, that wine of that day was very different than what's being sold in the, the liquor department of the local, you know, local store. Uh, the alcohol different, difference, uh, dilution was, was much different. Wines of that day were, were diluted with water anywhere from three parts to one to eight parts to one, and, and sometimes more. And so we're, when we talk about this issue, we have to remember, remember to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. I would, uh, someone asked me, after that message that I preached, if we were drinking that which they were drinking as a, um, as a beverage back in Bible days, 
So take yourself, put yourself back in to the New Testament era. Would it be okay to drink that which they drank, which was called wine, even though by definitions today that it would not be? Everybody understand? I'm trying to make it clear. And I said, it would probably be fine. Because uh, even though you, would, if, if you did that, such a diluted um, beverage, would, you would have to drink like gallons of it in order to get buzzed. And so it, it wasn't considered that. But even then, it's the idea the deacons and the pastors are not known. T- their reputation is, you know what? Those guys are great wine drinkers. They're not to have a reputation for that. They're not to be known for that. And so when he's talking here about those who are in leadership in the local church, their reputation is to be people who are absolutely clear-headed. I was reading Albert Barnes, who was a commentator in the 1800s, and he said this. He said, even the heathen priests on entering a temple did not drink wine. The use of wine and of strong drinks of all kinds was absolutely prohibited to the Jewish ministers of every rank when they were about to engage in the service of God. Why should it then be any more proper for a Christian minister to drink wine than for a Jewish or a heathen priest? Shall a minister of the gospel be less holy than they? Shall he have a feebler sense of the purity of his vocation? Shall he be less careful lest he expose himself to the possibility of conducting the services of religion in an irreverent and silly manner? Shall he venture to approach the altar of God under the influence of intoxicating drinks when a sense of propriety restrained the heathen priest and the solemn statute of Jehovah restrained the Jewish priest from doing it? Good questions. The deacon, as well as the pastor, is to be clear-headed. And, like the pastor, he is to be content. Verse 8, not greedy of filthy lucre. Uh, Someone rightly pointed out that the early deacons were in charge of a lot of money. And uh, when the distribution and buying food for the widows and so on, you get a greedy person in that situation, you know, of putting, you know, taking money that had been collected, and if someone's greedy, it'd be very tempting, wouldn't it, to take a few of those, those drachmas and, and drop them in, in, the, in uh, the folds of your robe. You know, it would, it would be very tempting for a greedy individual uh, to do that, um, to use funds in selfish ways. It's why godly men were to be in charge. Someone rightly pointed out that a hog can't look up. Now, I've never scientifically verified that. Verified that. Is that true? A, a hog can't look up? No hog farmers here tonight, I see. Um, but the idea is, is that they can look straight ahead and they can look down, but really they're not built to look, you know, bend their necks and look up. Greed fastens the attention on this world. And they cannot see any, any higher picture. Not to have, you're not to have someone like that in a position where there's greed involved within their lives. And they're to be authentic and genuine and sincere in their faith in Christ. Look at verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. That word holding means grasped. Taken a hold of. He has a firm grasp on the faith. When it says mystery, it's not talking about some mystery and some secret that can't be understood. It's talking about something that it was revealed. And so these are individuals that have a very good grasp upon the faith. And the idea is, is that they, they know their Bibles, for one thing. They don't just sit in meetings and decide how to run the church. They, they are dictated by biblical principles. We have had conversation to just today over the dinner table when we were uh, you know, fellowshipping together as a family, and we were talking about, the, uh, at least I think I, I offered the, the idea that, that I was very concerned that people were, uh, younger people in churches were not operating from a base of scriptural knowledge. 
but we're being influenced by other ideas, the ideas of psychology and the ideas of, of, of philosophy uh, that were secular in nature, and their base was not on scripture. Well, the deacons, these individuals must understand Christian doctrine and obey it. Deacons ought to have a good understanding of theology. The, the prominent distinction between pastors and deacons is the matter of teaching, but it is not a distinction in the matter of knowledge. What he is saying here is that those who serve in the area of a deacon should have a good understanding of, of Christianity, of the scripture, and, and someone who does so with a pure conscience, meaning that they are trying to the best of their ability to live the Christian life in dignity and honor. I'm thankful uh, to have served with, with great deacons, uh, both in other ministries and here at Calvary. Uh, but my first church, our first ministry that we went to, and I was a very young guy, uh, had the election of a deacon before I arrived on scene. And he was in place for a few months. The congregation had, had, a, had elected him as a deacon and chosen him to serve, who was a man who should never, ever have been made a deacon. Um, quite honestly, I do not know how this man ever was considered and it wasn't too long before I started getting reports from the community and uh, about his uh, activities at, at auction sales and, and mm, uh, kind of dishonest behavior uh, that he had uh, engaged in. He was also someone that was very active in, in he, was, he farmed, but also he, was, he worked for General Motors and was a union steward. And he had a very contentious spirit. And since I was the pastor, I was there for management. And since he was a deacon, his job was to protect the people from the pastor and to run interference. And it was just a mentality that was just an absolute disaster for the operation of that local church. He is to hold the mystery of the faith, and, and I would say, by the way, as well, that he had very little theological grounding, very little, very shallow. Um, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. They were to be godly. We are to strive, both as pastors and as deacons, to, to in our personal walk with God, to have a personal walk with God, and then to display that consistently in front of lost people especially, but especially uh, as well among the members of the local church. There's a mentality that in, in churches, and I've seen it more than once, several times through the years, not necessarily in, in our local church, but I've heard of it where they say, well, somebody is a, is a, he's a good businessman. Let's make him a deacon. What do you think about that? Well, he's good with, he's good with business. He, we should put him over the affairs of the church. Does it follow that if someone is a good businessman, that he would also make a good deacon? Does that follow? I hope you're going to say no. <laughs> uh, it doesn't follow. There was a, uh, a young child who named John. His name was John Watson. He grew up to be a the theologian, but he said that he used to, when as he, he was a boy, uh, acknowledging the deacons of the church, and he said uh, one old man had very white hair and a meek, reverent face, caught his attention as a young lad, and, and he said one day he was walking on the road and passed a man breaking stones, and the white hair caught his attention, and he looked back and recognized the deacon who had been serving communion and helping to serve the Lord's Supper and the, and the church. 
And he went home and he told his father that he had, that he had seen this guy and he was surprised uh, that he had seen him along the roadside breaking up stones. His father explained to him that the reason why the old man held so high a place in the church was that although he was one of the poorest men in all the town, he was one of the holiest. He said he breaks stones for a living, but he knows more about God than any person I have ever met. Listen, that is that. The idea of of somebody who holds, who grasps the faith, but also lives his Christian life with integrity. Many churches are not very cautious in who they put in those roles, about who they choose as deacons. I, I, I've heard of people who have hardly been saved any length of time at all, being thrust into the position of a deacon. I'm thinking to myself, if the pastor's not to be a novice, why in the world are they taking this relatively young believer and putting him in that position. And a lot of times what it is is that, you know, they're, they're basically at that point looking for a warm body that, you know, that breathes oxygen. <laughs> and uh, to put them in there because, well, we've got to have five or we've got to have eight or we've got to, who says? I mean, what we are to do is look at what the scripture says first. That's why I'm saying our base should always be what the scripture says, right? Always should be that. And then go from there. And if there are not qualified individuals, then what you do is reduce the number rather than having someone that should not be in that position. Verse 10 tells us that this individual is also reliable. Let these also first be proved. Uh, What that means is that they uh, have proved by their lives and their lifestyle that they're dependable and stable and trustworthy. They must have demonstrated that they were not only Christians, but were demonstrably trustworthy. And then in verse 12, it says they are to be domestically approved. Again, these are things that it says about the pastor, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but it says the deacons should be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Now, concerning the pastor, it does give a little caveat there. It says uh, if he doesn't know how to, to rule his own house, how in the world is he going to – doesn't say how in the world. It says how shall he rule the ch- uh, church of God. So the element there is one of example and of this individual is obviously a, has leadership uh, capability. Um, his at-home children were to be in control. He was to be the governor, not necessarily the dictator, but the governor of his home. And there was a certain integrity they were to maintain within the confines of the home. And I elaborated a lot when I talked about this with with the pastor. So it's an essential office, and there are very uh, distinct credentials for deacons. But then it goes on, talks about the ancillary conditions for ministry women. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Now, here comes the question. The, the personal pronoun, or the possessive pronoun, there, is not there. T-H-E-E-I-R is not T-H-E-R-E in the original language. If you notice, it... Um, It's in italics there, even so must their wives. What it literally says, even so women. The word for women, which is also the word for wives, is the word used in the original language there. So whenever you see something in italics in the King James, it is something that's been added by the translators. So the question is, was there a good reason for that? Well, are, are there alternative understandings? Well, I, will, I would tell you that First of all, there are certain things that are not negotiable. When it it says, even so, that that phrase is there, and it is exactly the same phrase that is in verse 8. Likewise, it's in like manner or corresponding to, even so, the women. So that, what we're talking about is a balanced counterpart to what, he's talking about in reference to the bishop, the pastor, and in reference to the deacons. 
Ministry women, he says, are people that are likewise in a complementary counterpart to the deacons and to the pastor. Um, it's like having salt and pepper shakers that match, right? They're, 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 a, they're supposed to be similar to one another and complementary to one another. Well, likewise, it says the wives or the women should be, and here we have this word grave again, by the way, let's, let's just back up. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so they're balanced. They are females. They are ministry-minded women. Um, the question is, who does this refer to? Were there female deacons in the early church? Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16, would you? The book of Romans chapter 16, and it does tell us there that there was a lady, and her name was Phoebe. And Paul says concerning Phoebe in chapter 16 and verse 1 of Romans, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, who is a, or which is a servant. You know what that word is? It's the word deacon a servant of the church, which is at Sencria. So here was a lady who served in the church at another city who was being sent on a mission, some kind of job that uh, to the, apparently to Rome or to whoever he's writing here from Rome. But he says, I commend to you this lady who is a servant of this church. Now, that implies that she had a specialized role there in that church, did something there, served in some way. We know it wasn't in, in a teaching ministry in terms of a pastor role or even an administrative position of a deacon's role, but she was indeed a servant of that church. So the question is, in 1 Timothy 3, are we talking about someone like that, ladies appointed within a local church to serve in various capacities? Um, is that an open question? It may be. I will acknowledge that there is there are people who, who take different views on this. I at one church I pastored, I had uh, I found out after I accepted the pastorate there that we had deaconesses. We had deacons. And we had deaconesses. And I'm th after I find that out, I said, uh oh. But I shouldn't have been worried. Those ladies, they had a magnificent. Uh, ministry among, especially among senior adults in, in our fellowship of believers, and they wrote our missionaries, they corresponded with them, uh, they just had, they, they sent our missionaries uh, gifts, and they had just a really wonderful role, and they, they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't try to take over, we, we had a designated budget for those ladies, uh, it was their money. <laughs> And um, sometimes, sometimes they kind of laid claim on that money because they, they used it well. I'm not, I'm not debating that, but um, just a great group of servants, and they referred to them as deaconesses. Well, Phoebe was one of those. Or is this referring to deacon's wives? Or is it referring to both pastors and deacon's wives? Even so, it says, even so must the women. Now, my inclination is to hold to that, that the, what this is referring to is concerning both, both the deacon's wives, if they're married, and the pastor's wives, if they are married, which opens up another question, do they have to be married? I don't think so. But if they are, uh, this is what it says, I think, concerning those ladies. Um, I think a strong argument for that this is to refer to the, both the wives of pastors and deacons. The context lends it to, to that, that this is what we're talking about. She is to be grave. The ministry complement is, is like these other serving roles within the local church. She is to be grave. Again, means a certain dignity and rank, honorability of good character and reputation. They were to be controlled in speech. If you look at verse uh, 
11. They are to be grave, not slanderers. Uh, again, I think this is, refer- this is the word dialogos. It's the same word where it says double-tongued. Um, they should not be of too uh, of dishonest character and so on, like the, like the deacons not saying one thing to one person and another thing. It's translated slander. The word in the original is dialogos. It's the very same word about that's used to the deacons in verse 8. Um, they are to be kind in their speech. That is implied there in, in that word slander. They are to be kind. Um, the, uh, I'm looking back here. You know, let me, let me back up. Let me back up. Even so must their wives be grave. That's honest, dignified, not slanders. That is, excuse me, that is not the word dialogos. I'm sorry. It is the word diabolos. How does that word sound? Diabolos is a word used of Satan. And it is used several times. This word slanderer. John John Phillips said, he said, this title is used for the evil one some 34 times in the New Testament, Diabolos. In the Garden of Eden, the devil slandered God when he was talking to man. In the book of Job, the devil slandered man when he was talking to God. So when God insists that a deacon's wife or a ministry woman, if you will, not be a slanderer, he implies that a slanderous woman does the devil's work and thus disqualifies her. Uh, from serving, and by implication, her husband from the office. Women, ladies, forgive me, and maybe this is a generalization that I should not make, and if you want to take me to task for it, you do so after the service, okay? Um, Women, in my experience, tend to fight behind the scenes. They tend to talk about people out of earshot of those people. Men... Are seem to be, in my experience, again, and you'll say, Preacher, your experience is terrible. Okay, or maybe it is. Uh, maybe I should get out more. But men, if they have a problem with one another, are more likely to go nose to nose. And rather than talk behind someone's back and, and do damage in order to undercut them. That has not been my experience with women. Women tend to talk to their friends and undercut in the background. Now, you can, you can disagree if you want, but I think that's true both in, in, in the church when it starts to happen, and I think it's true also in business, in the business world, in the corporate world, that damage and attacks are made in a slanderous way with the tongue. Behind the scenes, defamation, smear, disparagement, character assassination. I'm not saying that men don't do that. They do. I'm just saying that that men fight differently than women tend to fight. And you may you may think that that's a sexist perspective, but in my observation that is how it's done. Not slanderers. Not accusative, disparaging, malicious, fault fighting. The idea is of someone who defames and smears and disparages others behind the scenes. This is the word that is used, not diablos, not like Satan. Then it uses the word that she is sober. That is a word meaning temperate and in control. This gal is not a drama queen. She can control her thoughts and by virtue control her emotions and by virtue of that control what she says. I uh, saw a, an acrostic of the word drama, and they were talking about drama queens. And I thought I'd share that with you tonight. It's D-R-A-M-A, and the D in the first, in the first letter of, of drama is destructive. Uh, drama first starts with opening our mouth. And Proverbs 13.3 says, He that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. The author of this said, being a drama queen is very destructive. It's destructive to everyone involved. And then the next word is R, which stands for rebellious. 
Rebellion is open resistance to authority. It's one of the worst things you can bring into your family or into your church is conflict or drama. They are rebels at heart. I remember vividly, and my wife can, was there as well, of a woman who had undercut our ministry many, many years ago, a deacon's wife, had undercut our ministry, and uh, things would get started, rumors and stories and stuff, but it all eventually traced back to this one individual. And she sat in our, our living room and looked me in the face, and she said this, I guess I just don't like authority. Her words. And, you know, I couldn't debate what she really didn't like. Authority. Rebellious. And then the A in drama Arrogant. Arrogance is defined as exaggerating one's own worth and showing an offensive attitude of superiority. In other words, that's pride. Arrogance. Um, and then the next word is manipulative. You know, the last, next letter in drama is manipulative. To manipulate someone means to control or influence them cleverly or unfairly in order to get something that you desire. The author of this said, drama queens are so starved for attention that they manipulate situations in order to get it. And unfortunately, the attention they often do get is negative. And then the A is abusive. Abusive. In the midst of gratifying their own needs for acceptance, love, and attention, drama queens violate these same needs in others. And in so doing, they also wear people out and push them away. So... Um, that, that, that was the acrostic for drama queen. But there was another, con, uh, another acrostic based upon the word peace. I want to share that with you too. The P in peace means that we should purpose to go to Jesus first, not last. The E stands for endeavor to be quiet, even if, there, if, even, even if it means my reputation could be disgraced. The A Avoid obsessing over my image and let God get the glory. The C, cease from telling all my stories. Remember, some things just need to stay between you and the Lord. And then E, entrust the Lord with my problems, knowing he will walk me through in his perfect timing. I think that's great stuff. You know, drama as opposed to peace. What's your choice? <laughs> What's the best choice? Well, peace. And then uh, concerning the ministry of women, it says faithful in all things, meaning proven. This is the same kind of idea of reliable in, uh, in reference to the deacon. So these are the ancillary conditions for ministry of women. But I want us to close out in, these last, um, in this last verse that we're looking at in verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. What is he talking about there? This is what I think he's talking about. There is on a deacon who, in, in the life of a deacon who decides they are going to serve well, there is an opportunity for advancement it, it sets the stage for advancement and effectiveness in both growth, personal growth, and personal ministry. I said at the beginning of this that there was a distinction between what it said concerning pastors and what it said concerning deacons. Pastor just desires a good work. But the deacons, what it says concerning them, those that use this office well, purchase to themselves a good degree. Now, what does that mean? This means that if he fulfills his responsibilities, and by the way, I'm quoting here from a fellow by the name of S.J. Robinson, it means that if he fulfills his responsibilities conscientiously, he will have restored the reputation of the church and the community, and the work he has done will have enabled him to grow in his own Christian life. Now, you don't put him in the office. He's got to be, he, this, the deacon has to be, meet the credentials before he is appointed to the office, right? But once he's in the office and decides that he is going to really put his heart and soul and do the best job that he knows to do, if he decides to do that, he purchases to himself 
as if he is buying something, a good degree. Now, what's he talking about when he talks about a good degree? This term, this, this phrase, if you will, good degree, means an advancement in rank. It was a military term. So, serving well in the capacity of deacon prepares that individual for greater uh, for a greater rank and greater boldness in ministry. The idea is that if you do a good job as a corporal, then you might be made a sergeant. And if you do a good job as a sergeant, you might get promoted to lieutenant. And if you get you do a good job as a lieutenant, you might get promoted to captain. You get the gist of this? And it hinges upon what kind of job do you do. Now, if you get promoted to a sergeant and, you're, and you just don't do a very good job as a sergeant, are you going to get promoted? Not likely. Well, in some situations, you know, they might promote you out of there just to get rid of you. <laughs> but the idea is you do a good job, and then there is something bigger, more fruitful for you and a greater responsibility later. This is what he is saying concerning, and it's the difference between, uh, not in credentials so much, but in outcome, between a pastor and a deacon. It is, that word degree is an elevated step of honor. Think of the Olympics when you're competing in the Olympics. Is everybody a winner? No. There, there's typically, they recognize the first, second, and third place winners, and then everybody else is an also ran. And when they give out the honor, there is, typically, there is a difference in the height of the platforms, the dais that they stand upon. The first place is typically higher, and then there's second place and third place on either side, or sometimes in a descending order. But there's one higher. This is the idea. It's, it is a pest, pedestal from which, if you do a good job, you go to the next step. And what he is saying here is that those who try their best to do a good job, if they, if they use the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves this increase in rank. And then he says this, and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is almost a foreign concept in these days of equality of recognition. What they want, they call it equality of outcome. There isn't somebody that's first or second or third. Everybody's got to be the same. Everybody gets a trophy. I was at a graduation for one of my grandchildren, and uh, he got a trophy for being the most I may be getting this wrong, but I think it's right. The most progressed in learning to keep quiet. Wasn't it something like that? In other words, he, he was a motor mouth and talked all the time, and, and he, he was making progress, and he got a trophy. Everybody got a trophy for something. They made up, they made up criteria so that every kid in the kindergarten class got a trophy. Everybody's a winner. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, should they give out trophies for learning to keep your mouth shut? Well, maybe that would be good for adults. Get a trophy for learning to keep our mouth shut. Understand that this is not, when it talks about an increased rank, this is not about gaining power. This is about gaining an opportunity for increased service. It's not a matter that, oh, now everybody's got to salute you. That's not, that's not in the works at all. It's a matter that there are expanded opportunities for people who give their all in the ministry position that they are in right now. He that is faithful in little things, right, are made ruler over many things. And the idea of faithfulness is in mind here for a person who decides they are going to serve well. 
And it says, those who do this advance, purchase to themselves this advanced right rank, and then he says, and great boldness in the faith. You know what that means? That means personal growth to the point where they want to serve Christ and do so confidently. Great boldness is the idea of confidence. They get an increased opportunity. You realize that two of the deacons in Acts chapter 6 stand out. They're mentioned elsewhere. You, you remember who they are? The two of the seven that are named? There's, everybody's talking at the same time. And I can't discern. <laughs> Stephen and Philip. Is that what everybody else said? Okay, good for you, you scholars. Do you realize who they were that Stephen witnessed boldly before hateful people and stood there facing them down, absolutely no fear, and exalted Christ, and he, he was the first martyr of the church. And by the way, who was standing by holding the coats and witnessed all of that? Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, the apostle. Did that have an effect on Paul? You better believe it. Stephen was the first martyr. Philip was the first. They called him Philip the, what, do you remember? The evangelist. He was the first missionary. Really, realize he went down to Samaria and did great wonders there. And, let, and the Samaritans by the, you know, multitudes came to Christ. I think that's what he's talking about here. The congregation appointed them. And then they did those jobs well. And then they received great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The fact is that the office of a deacon is a special office in the church. And what the author under inspiration is claiming is that a person who serves well in that position of deacon has earned the honor associated with serving well and then in accompanying that, there is this boldness and uh, expansion. It's, it's like a stepping off point into greater ministry. Something to be said about the deacon serving that it does not say about the pastor. A good, a good degree. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your word and what it says concerning this opportunity for service. And I pray that we would be thinking biblically, not just about this, but about all things, that you would be honored by not simply our understanding of them, but by, but by our, our submission to complying with them. We know that we are not everything that we ought to be. None of us are. But you have commanded us to serve you with our whole heart and our whole disposition. And I pray for each one of our deacons here at Calvary and for those who may serve in that position. May they realize the importance of it. May they realize the potential of it. And we know that there are many people there are many people in ministry today who, who began by serving in the role of a deacon. We thank you for, for uh, this word tonight, and we pray that we be complicit and submissive to it. Uh, complicit with it, involved with it, compliant with it, and submissive. In Jesus' name, with head bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you, whole principle behind this, the principle is to be faithful in small things, smaller things. And God will make you ruler over many things. The idea is faithfulness now in what God has called you to do. Are you faithful now in what God has called you to do? Are you putting all your effort into it? Or are you coasting? I believe God says here, if you're faithful, 
if you're if you're submissive to the very best you can do that that doors of opportunity and and your and personal growth happens when you do that the only question is are you committed 